today to guide us through this uh, to this topic, and she has a PhD in polymer synthesis uh, from Chalmers University of Technology as well. Our program today uh, it's uh, it's very is very much to the point. So we will have uh, a look into the value of life cycle assessment in bus tenders, also the ambitions uh, in bus businesses, the industry. Uh, we will also have a look to the ongoing regulations and finally we'll have some conclusions. So as usual, please uh, place your questions in the chat, raise your hand. We are always happy to have you also contributing actively to the webinar, so don't be shy. Um, this is uh, this is the moment for us to to discuss with uh, with our two speakers. So let us uh, let us know about your questions, comments, raise your hand. So as I said, um, the webinar is already being recorded. Keep this in mind should you not wish to be uh, recorded uh, with your image. And uh, yeah, again, so mute uh, yourself per default so that we can have uh, a smooth presentation. Thanks a lot. And I think with this, uh, we can already uh, give the floor to, to Maria to start. Thank you, Aina. And uh, let's see, so I can share now because I'm not able to share. I think you have to make me. Second, true. Normally, normally it works, but let me yeah, because just quickly. It's, uh, faded out that share button there, so. Hmm. Sorry for that. Give me one second. No Normally, yeah, like it should. Presenter, so yeah. Yes. So make presenter. Yeah. And I would also make your presenter, Maria, just in case. Both of you should be now seeing the sharing button. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, thank you for that introduction, Ida. And uh, before we start with our topic for today, I could just mention a few words about uh, Volvo Buses and the group that we belong to, the Volvo Group. Uh, it's a transport solution provider, and we have then uh, product and services in connection to uh, trucks, construction equipment, buses, and power solutions for marine and industrial applications. And when it comes to electric mobility, we have then uh, electric buses, a range of electric trucks, and now also electrified construction equipments. But let's get to the topic for today. Uh, I will start by talking about the value of life cycle assessment in bus tenders, and then a little bit about the ambitions. Then uh, Maria Valenius, my colleague here, she will go through and uh, dig a little bit deeper into life cycle assessment as such. And then we'll have a short summary. And uh, we're also happy to uh, share then if you have any questions or so, we can have a discussion then. Uh, and uh, it's always interesting to look back the learning curve. What has actually happened in the last 15 to 20 years? And how has the focus changed in this area? And uh, at 2005, we looked on to reduce fuel consumption. That was then the focus in the industry. Uh, we started to invent our hybrid vehicles. That was a great, we could save like 25 to 30 percent uh, uh, fuel. Uh, but we also realized then that uh, the hybrid bus was a very nice uh, product that was so uh, you, can, you can run only on the battery. Uh, it was uh, quiet and had zero tailpipe emission. And that moved us into then having electric buses, but still the main target was to have zero tailpipe emissions and we had a good local environment. Uh, in 2015, when electric buses started to come into the operations, then the questions came also from, from the uh, citizens, from the cities, but what about the electricity? Where does that come from? How clean is actually the electric bus? And we're starting to have the well-to-wheel perspective. Moving from tank to wheel to well to wheel. Now we are more into after 2020, the last years, looking into also the complete life cycle of the bus. What is the environmental uh, impact? And that's where life cycle assessment as a method has moved into also the bus industry. 
Uh, and the last years, we've also seen that it's not just life cycle assessment, it's sustainability as such that is focused in the tenders. And that is, of course, natural, as we see as the whole world is now focusing on lowering the greenhouse em green gas emissions and so. And uh, all cities, companies, countries are putting these very ambitious targets. And they are in connection to climate, greenhouse emissions, resources, where does the material come from? And also people. Uh, how are the people doing in the, the whole through the value chain here? Uh, and we see in the tenders that PTAs and PTOs, they create different evaluation methods, uh, basically questionnaires in the public tenders. Uh, but today we are lacking standard uh, for this uh, and the evaluation formats uh, look different and it's very difficult to make a scoring. Yeah, and it's basically so, as of today, since this is LCA is new in the bus industry, it's very difficult to make, make or it's almost impossible, it is impossible to make a one-to-one -one comparison. But still, there is a value of starting to doing this work because it pinpoints the right questions and it also makes us to understand what, where should we improve. And what is then the ambition? Uh, we have the vehicle as such. And when we just looked at the tag to wheel, we were here. Now we are into looking all through the value chain from the vehicle production to all the logistics, everything here in this space, the use space and the end of life. And for a commercial vehicle, uh, the use phase, that is usually the main part where you have the biggest CO2 footprint. That is if you have uh, not really clean energy, if you have the electricity is uh, almost uh, have um, zero emission, like in the electricity in Sweden where it's very clean, it's also more like uh, 30, 40 grams CO2 per kilowatt hours, then the use phase is uh, quite small. It's uh, And then the um, uh, you can see that the production phase and the use phase is almost the same. But in most countries, uh, you have uh, electricity that comes from other sources, also with, uh, non uh, with non fossil free. And then the use phase is the main part. So this is, of course, very different if you compare to a personal vehicle where the production of the vehicle and the battery has a much more impact on the whole well to wheel perspective. Uh, and the ambition then for the bus industry is now to start to make environmental declaration and environmental product declarations. And uh, my colleague Maria will uh, in a minute to, to dig a little bit deeper into this. Um, but uh, that we're starting to see that uh, bus, different bus manufacturers are now producing this. And what does it actually do? And you know, what does it actually say in environmental declaration? It shows how the impact is all through the product life phases. An example here is like you can see the emissions per passenger kilometer from the production phase, the maintenance phase and the end of life. This will, of course, depends a lot on, as we said before, how the electricity mix looks. Uh, you can also see the depletion of natural resources and the material composition. So for the complete uh, vehicle as such, what type, what, via, what materials are in the bus and how much of that is then recycled. And you can also get a, an idea about the recyclability and recoverability rate. And now Maria, please, uh, if you continue here with uh, the assess, assessing the environmental impact of the bus, and then I will allow you as a presenter. Thank you, Maria. So let's move into assessing the environmental impact and let's I guess some of you have uh, maybe many years of uh, experience of life cycle assessments or the other methods. But for those of you who are new to this area, I would say that sometimes this creates quite a big confusion. First of all, you have several ways of doing this kind of declaration. 
uh, in our questionnaires uh, from the PTOs, PTAs, you could be asked to provide a carbon footprint, environmental declaration, or even an EPD, environmental product declaration. And there are differences between the three uh, methods. You have uh, different standards applying to it. Uh, life cycle assessment, even though it could be, you know, merged into one big uh, group, it's still made in different ways with different system boundaries, which means that the life cycle assessment cannot be mixed together for the other ones. You need to provide to do it according to the standards. And carbon footprint can be third party very verified. If you make your own, it's still a self declaration if you haven't had it third party verified. And the environmental product declaration also states that you should use product category rules. And luckily we have such for buses. And then you can publish it or should publish it at an uh, environmental product declaration program manager provider. So, what, what are those methods? Carbon footprint, it's only about uh, the greenhouse gas. Carbon footprint, carbon dioxide equivalents, not to be confused with only looking at the CO2 emissions, but we will come to that. Uh, the carbon footprint is also used to estimate or calculate scope one, two, and three for the science-based targets. And uh, if you are in that program, you know what I'm talking about. The environmental product declarations uh, is becoming more and more important, I would say, but we will come to that too. But it's a type three declaration and quantifies, really quantifies environmental information on the life cycle of a product or service. And it should enable comparisons between products. So we should be able to compare buses with buses. Uh, and also then we have the, the newcomer well, it's not that new, uh, but it's the product environmental footprint, the PEF. And maybe you have come in contact with that uh, regarding batteries. And uh, there's big discussions about heavy duty uh, functional units for buses, for instance. And there we have a multi criteria measure of the environmental performance of a product or service or anything else throughout its life cycle. And in this case, the purpose is to reduce the environmental impact. So big different purposes. And how does it work? What are the actual differences between methodologies? I've just made an overview of the most um, significant ones. So if we look at the standards for carbon footprint, you use also apart from the life cycle assessment, uh, 1440 and 1444, you also apply the 14067. For the environmental product declaration, you also have the product category rules. And when you publish it, it's also said to be done according to 14025. For the PEF, the, there is a PEF framework. You use the ISO 1440 and 44 for the LCA and the PEFCR product uh, environmental footprint category rules may not be the same as for the PCR that we talked about for the environmental product declarations. And now they are making one for uh, batteries, but we do not yet have one for buses, which means that it's still too difficult and a bit of a risk to perform one yourself at the moment. Other difference is that for carbon footprint, we only have one impact category, and that is climate change, also called greenhouse gas, also called global warming potential. So, you know, uh, it's got a quite a few names, 
And in environmental product decoration, at least you should use seven default impact categories, which could be uh, acidification, climate change, uh, eutrophication, etc. And for the product, the PEF, uh, we have 16 default impact categories, but the impact categories is actually to multiply the value you get in your um, of the materials or substances you have in your uh, from your LCA, and then you multiply it with a factor. So it's just a number of ways to do that, because if you only use one impact category, uh, you will get one answer. And if you use the next one, like acidification, you might get another answer. Some other uh, part of the life cycle is the hot topic. So to avoid that, we should have more than three impact categories. And if we look at the climate change, uh, the factors of that to be able to calculate mm -hmm. the global warming potential, uh, fossil CO2 is one because that's what you compare with. So in this case, any methane will be 25 times worse than the same amount of CO2. And nitrous oxide laughing gas will be 298 times worse than CO2. And then you think, yeah, but let's use the same uh, factors. And then I say, why should we? So fossil CO2 is still the same. And but here they have they are using 28 as a measure and 265 from nitrous oxide. So already there, we will not get the same results, even though we have the same results uh, from the inventory, meaning the grams and kilos of various substances. And to make it even more exciting, I would say, uh, for the PEF, you still have fossil CO2, one, but you also add fossil methane, 36.8. The LCA itself may be made in a different way because we have collected various types of data depending on the necessity of uh, actually um, collecting them. On the other hand, even if we have a carbon footprint of, for instance, a chassis, just as an example, we cannot use that either. We cannot mix that either with a PEF or with the EPD, because that's only a one way, uh, one def uh, evaluating parameter, the carbon, the CO2 equivalence, but uh, we cannot mix. So we should need to, to be very clear about what we are doing and what we are deciding to do. Is it a PEF, an EPD, or a carbon footprint? You might be able to use some of the uh, life cycle assessment data, but depending on how you have collected it, it may not be true. So now I will really go into basics. So those of you who know this already, please bear with me. Uh, we, we need to start with something. We need to make um, a bus NCA, EPD, whatever. So how should you use, choose the object for this LCA. We all know that we have a number of variants. It depends on the customer, what you do, and so on and so forth. But in LCA methodology, you have to choose one because it needs to be a built vehicle in the sense that uh, we should not, you cannot use a master boom with all the parts available, you know, for the variants, because then you have built the bus and you will have all the parts not put uh, adding uh, to this variant on the side. So you need to choose something that is representative. When you have done that, you need to start mapping the material content of all parts, the chemical products like dried paint and glues, which will be on the bus when it rolls out of the garage, lubricants, etc. You need to map the production data, preventive maintenance, use phase based on maximum number of passengers, 
So you will have to find also there maybe a use case that you may not be used to because it's not what you normally use. OK, so let's go for this um, chosen variant. OK, this is the, the, um, the actual life cycle of it. You see all the circular flows, which is super good from a sustainability perspective. But from an NCA perspective, it's too complicated. For all these phases, you also need to map for each one of those use of energy, use of resources, use of water, and emissions to air and water, not always known, but it comes from the database. And also the waste divided into various categories, because it's important if it's recycled, <clears throat> or if it's um, incinerated, or if it's put in a landfill. And also the transport, but historically, the transport between uh, the different sites has not been so important. So sometimes we exclude that from the NCAs. So what we do then is to try to simplify. So raw materials will probably be the raw materials plus, well, maybe not parts manufacturer, but at least material manufacturer and we will also ask for recycled content in that case because we cannot uh, sort of loop it back we need to know it from the beginning so we need to cut the circular flows that's why we have you know these uh, flows here we don't know if they are looped back and if we will only sort of handle it in the end of life phase that it's recycled, etc. And then we have strategies for that according to the LCA, the standards, etc. How to calculate. And we also need to map um, use resources, consumption of fuel and electricity and the emissions, as I said before. OK, moving to the next day, stage, we would like to prepare an EPD. <clears throat> we have the simplified phases, we have done the LCA, we have made an extensive report, we have sent it to the third party uh, auditor, and if you are lucky and after a lot of questions from them, you might be able to say, yes, we got it, it's uh, approved, and then you can also say that it's uh, ISO according to ISO 14025, if you publish it on one of the websites for EPD. So that's how you do it. But, you know, it's a long way and we need to become uh, providers of the input data. If we are not doing the LCA ourselves, we need to prepare good data because uh, if we have bad input, we will also get bad output. And the thing is, the more we learn about our products, the impact of our products may go up. So the less we know, the less data we have, we, we cannot assess non-existing data. So we should be aware of that, that if we start asking our suppliers about data on their production and waste and so on and so forth, the first time we may not get, get all data because they don't know it or they haven't had time to investigate. But the next time, maybe they will add that and then you have a higher, uh, an increase in your footprint. And now we come to the summary, please, Maria. Yes, thank you, Maria. And I think you can still uh, you can still uh, have the uh, yeah the presentation. That's better. Uh, and uh, thank you for that very good uh, review. And uh, I think we really have to be humble here about the topic as such. But it's not that we. It's easy to get scared away also because it's it uh, is of course a lot of details here and. Uh, um, but again, I think it's uh, through this different cooperations and just start working with it. We can, uh, as an industry and also together with our 
uh, operators and PTAs find a way here going forward. And uh, I can mention then also in the uh, UITP uh, collaboration, uh, we have this bus tender structure document. There we are a working group looking into the first level of life cycle assessment and uh, making like a proposal how that should be treated in the, the tendering. But it is a challenge. Uh, and I think that's what it's good, Maria, that you really you don't hide anything here because it is a challenge. And, and but I think uh, we are ready to take it on here. Uh, but uh, we need to have skilled people and we have also to and I think that's part of this session to understand for uh, if you if someone out there is evaluating tenders here in this group is like uh, to to have this basic knowledge to understand the background is very important uh, because there could be a lot of figures presented, but uh, you have to look behind the figures to and understand. Uh, please take the next uh, there, Marie. Please yeah. give me control. Unfortunately, ah, okay. I Sorry, stopped. Ah, OK, and now my, my PC froze now. <laughs> oh. Okay. I'll see if I can. I will send uh, it. No, no, yeah, no, it's perfect. Uh, OK, and I think that leads us uh, to uh, the next part here, because if we're doing this extensive work here, pinpointing, OK, all these different uh, parts of uh, the uh, production and materials that we need to improve, uh, we need to change things. But what is actually then the value? Because if we, we want to be really good here, if we want to reach all these ambitious targets that we have set up as companies, as cities, as countries even, uh, we have to put a value on the environmental part. And since this is not an exact science, it's not that you can get a value that is just uh, you get a value out of the LSA 1.3 and 1.5, you can compare them. Uh, you have to find ways in a tender to still evaluate this LCA or EPD that is shown in the tender. What is the value of that one? And how can you compare different vehicles to one another? But it has to be a value because if we want to move forward here, we have to put a value on it. And I think that's where we are now. We're moving from life cycle assessment to complete sustainability and sustainability value in tenders. Uh, that was my last slide of today. Thank you. And I think we are very happy to get some questions here. We have time here, I see. We are have 20 minutes left. Uh, but Ida, how do you want to run this um, for the question part here? Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, both of you, for the for the very complete presentation and the other view and this overview. I think uh, we can uh, we can open the, the floor to the participants. Please uh, just raise your hand. Uh, I don't know if you have any issue in placing questions in the chat. Uh, I think the chat is working as usual, but let me know. Um, but yeah, even better because we have uh, 20 minutes. Uh, just just raise your hands and, and share also your experience. It's not working, Ida, I think. Chat it's not working, me. right? Because it's not, um, it's not at least it's not active in my uh, teams. OK, <laughs> I don't know. Thanks a lot, Matthias. Uh, I don't know what is the issue today uh, because I also had some disturbing <laughs> message that the recording was stopped and then start again. So we will see after the end of the webinar. But then uh, I would invite you to to yes, just to raise your hands, open your mic and, and put your questions. If not a question right now, perhaps uh yeah, while you while you yeah, Matthew, Matthew Greener, please go ahead. Hi. Hi there. Um there's a lot of different ways, as you've said, Maria, there's a lot of different ways of measuring it. Um, it's going to change as the supply chain increases in maturity. Mm. And that pace of change will change with each different manufacturer as their supply chain improves in maturity. So if we're trying to build and we're trying to encourage this to be built into tenders for operators to buy an OEM bus or for our public transport authorities to tender with operators. How do we ensure there's consistency in the measurement? Because every OEM will be at a different stage of this journey at, at mm. any one point in time. Exactly. <laughs> 
so, uh, so so building it building it into tenders as a measurable um criteria i think is personally at this point is flawed unless there is a standard measurement that everybody uses mm. So uh, in that case, uh, today, I would say that the EPD is the closest we can come to that. The thing is, we still have, you know, what kind of data do we have? Is everyone using uh, general average data or are they using primary data? Because if they are using primary data, maybe that primary data is worse than the general one or vice versa. But so how do we it, make sure yeah. every supply is using a standard? And this is this yeah. is where I come back to what I'm concerned mm -hmm. about is that we put we try to build this into a tender documentation as a measurable criteria that nobody uses a standard criteria to measure against. When we have sort, absolutely there's a standard test, everybody has to adhere to that standard test, and we know it's comparable to one another. Mm. Here, my concern with if we're for pushing this into a tender document we've got ambiguity and we have got not an accurate picture of who's doing the best out there. Mm. Um, and I worry that people like yourself that have much more data from a Volvo point of view, you might not have much more data and your figures might look worse because you know everything and others are using different data to hide things. Mm. And I think that's where it comes in that there is a value to put it in to get it started because we will not get it. Like if we, if we don't see it in the tenders, then there will be no no focus on it. So I think we need to start just saying, OK, require an EPD then. Uh, and then you start there and you, you look at it. And then, as you say, you will not be able to say, OK, this one is better or worse, but you have get it started. Mm. And then in the work that we do through uh, UITP, the tennis document, hopefully we can have some guidance there as a start. But uh, just I don't think we can just sit and wait. We have to get this started and then uh, we'll find a way forward. But I understand the complexity from your point of view. I, really, I, really and I, I think yeah. it's more mm. it shouldn't be a measurement mm. of comparing one versus another. Mm -hmm. It should be are you as an organization measuring this? Yes or no? Exactly. Into what level? And yeah. that that yeah. scores points based on your sustainability mm. agenda rather than the physical product itself, potentially. Mm. And I, I'm just mm. throwing that mm. out there as a, as a mm. concern because you're right. Mm. We have to start talking about it, but we can't necessarily give points because you might be advantaged no. or disadvantaged because people will be playing games. Mm. OK, exactly. thank you. And I think it's one basic thing that we've been talking a lot about is like uh, how many years that you should make your LCA for or for uh, how many kilometers. Because if you do that differently, you will come with totally different results. So just these basic things, if we could put these in place, we have a good start. Yeah. X number of years, X number of kilometers. Simple, I mean, but it's it's not there yet. OK, thank mm. you. Mm. Thanks, Matt. Victor. Uh, thank you, Aida. Yeah, well, uh, I will just say that um, I really agree with Matthew about his concerns. Um, I was the project manager of a Nordic project where we um, developed a methodology for collecting information on life cycle assessment um, and we had a it took lo a long time and we had a long uh, and, and very uh, fruitful di dialogue with the with the bus industry and especially with Volvo and and it became really clear to us that it doesn't make sense today to ask for information where you were going to compare the environmental uh, impact from two different products because it doesn't make sense at all. So what we asked for was to understand the quality of data that the uh, or that the, that the manufacturers uh, have and can can show us. So in our system, you get points for uh, using a third party evalu evaluation, actually uh, using the 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 the, the fourteen oh forty standard, and so we try to to say, okay, you can, if you don't have, if you just have made something, then we will look at it, and you get some points. But the the better documentation you have for your for your data, the more points you will get in in our uh, system. So, uh, but. But we also saw that there was, at least at that time, it was a couple of years ago when we when we had the, most of the dialogue with the bus industry, there was a quite strong opposition in parts of the bus industry towards 
uh, using the the uh, the environmental product declaration as a as a as a concept. Uh, there were were different reasons, but um, but uh, the, the 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 there was an. Uh, uh, there, there was some manufacturers who were not too pleased with the idea that we would start uh, looking at how much CO2 comes from the bus based on the same uh, methodology, because they were really worried that worried that that some manufacturers might not perform or, or use uh, use different uh, try to to get around it and have uh, ha have it looking more more better than it was. And, and and there was also an opposition towards actually publishing this information uh, uh, because there are some uh, manufacturers who who prefer to have it uh, to give it to their customers, but they don't want to show it to everybody. So we see different issues with the with the EPD system, and but I would really be happy if if it goes like you are talking about Maria because it will make it a lot easier for us instead of making that each PTA or each region make their own questionnaire that you can mm. have uh, some kind of of uh, of the same system because I also think that that you as a manufacturer will be it will be a lot of work for you if if 20 different uh, questionnaires come in on your table and you have to 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 answer all kind of different questions that mm. are in the basically actually the same but just raised mm. in different ways yeah. Yeah, yeah, thank you there, Victor. I think it's a very good point that you're making. I know you have made an extensive work there with your uh, uh, system there or, or, and so on. And uh, I think this uh, the UITP attempt in that working group is to take some influence from both the work that you have done and uh, we have seen in other tenders to put these questions in one single format, as you say, because of course in uh, tenders when uh, all the OEMs get uh, these uh, in different formats, it takes a lot of time and it's the same question, but it could be phrased in 10 different ways. So it would be great if we had like, okay, this is a standard format and that's what we use in the tenders. That would be excellent because then we can start from that baseline and then we can start to improve. Thanks a lot, Victor. Uh, we have also uh, Janina and then Christoph. Yes, um, thank you, Maria and Maria for this great comprehensive overview. Um, I was just wondering if um, if there are any um, or if you are um, as the working group or um, in, in different formats working maybe on a, I'd call it workaround to to overcome this um, difficulty in comparison as the A's, EPDs, whatever uh, we are. Uh, when we are preparing uh, bus tenders and we're very much waiting on um, integrating sustainability criteria in our tenders, uh, we were um, yeah, thinking a lot about how to, to actually um, um, or how to emphasize the topic of um, uh, reducing the environmental footprint or uh, impact of the bus, let's, let's, let's call it impact. So I think on, on the one hand side, uh, generating um, transparency about impact and CO2 in, in uh, uh, to be more specifically is important, but I think it's just one, uh, just one, one part, sorry for my English today, it's, it's only one part. So um, what, what I'm um, yeah, wondering is um, if, and I think we will still have to work with this insecurities um, um, of not being able to compare um, the data um, in, a, in, in a short term. So, um, yeah, maybe to make it short, um, like the, the last point you were uh, you're mentioning that the further development of um, decreasing the environmental impact. Are there any ideas yet how to integrate this topic in tenders? That's basically my question. Uh, I think I come back again to the attempt that we're doing in this working group within uh, UITP because there we are sitting together both uh, from uh, the PTA, PTO side together with the OEMs trying to find one, uh, one format and that is some work that will go on now until like mid-year here and then hopefully in the trend structure document there will be some guidelines. Uh, so that is our ambition. That's the first attempt, but I think that's just that's the starting point. But uh, it's something. 
Thanks, Janina. Yes, I think um, definitely this uh, this working group and and the and the goal of the working group, as Maria has described, is is to look at this and try to start some steps to harmonize what are the needs on on both sides, and at the end come with some uh, come out with some recommendations that most likely will evolve with time because I, I very much like the, the learning curve you presented, Maria. So from not taking much care about how the buses are produced, uh, we have improved the technology. Let's say that we are much more mature now, mature now so we are able now to consider uh, many other aspects around sustainability and not only LC8, which I think it's uh, it's also showing that uh, from uh, from the whole value chain of, uh, of electric buses and hopefully in the future also not only electric buses, we can we can understand how things are produced and arrived to our to our respective companies, no, considering the different suppliers. So um, very much uh, looking forward to the yes to the update of this tender structure document, which in the past already include this uh, chapter for electric mobility, now being updated as Maria uh, uh, described to you with the LCA considerations. Christoph, you had your hand risen as well. Yes, thank you, Aida. Thank you, Maria and Maria, for this very uh, clear uh, vision of the state of the art, because I think it's an uh, important topic, but not very uh, easy to, to explain. So thank you. Um, a question about the future. To your knowledge, do you see any any reason to, to keep hope in uh, this uh, PEF uh, regulation? Is there something coming in the next years, months? You mean like the category rules? Yes, to, to yeah. have a, a better tool, a better way to assess all yeah. these. Uh... Um, it will be more extent. Let's put it like this. What we are working with now is the battery regulation and the PEFCR for that. And, and that's really cumbersome because um, we as bus manufacturer, we always we, we sort of mix it together with what should the battery supplier supply to us? They wouldn't know the, the use case. And we, from the other hand, how can we implement the PEF in that case? Because it would be valuable data and we don't have anything to put it in because we cannot mix it with the EPD data that we might already have. We might have LCA data, but we might need to do it again because there will be different system boundaries. We need to collect more data, etc. So um, I don't know how far they can push it, but maybe they will start with the less complicated objects and then we will come at the end. And that means that, uh, yeah, we will, if we are producing batteries, or if uh, whoever is producing batteries, they need to provide the the sort of carbon footprint uh, based on PEF method methodology. So it's only uh, like one of the climate impacts. So maybe that's call it easy. Uh, but you need to you need to collect the data, <laughs> you know, from from the whole value chain, mm -hmm. and you are uh, valued according to if it's primary data from the actual supplier or from somebody else. And then you can think of the complexity of uh, a, a, a part supplier or a raw material supplier. They say, yeah, you know, but maybe it comes from uh, uh, the other side of the planet or it comes from Europe or it comes from America, depending on the supplier. We don't know. There's a mix. You know, there will be endless discussions before you can actually say how to do it. Okay, thanks. And, and the, the <laughs> models are still different, so the, the problem will yeah. be, uh, will remain. Okay, thanks. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot, Christoph. I see also Alejandro. Yes, thank you. Hi. Thanks for the nice presentation. I was wondering how long does it take to get one EPD and how much does it cost? An EPD? It depends on how good data you have, how well developed systems you have. Uh, if you have to do a lot, uh, also how you divide work, you can, uh, let's say that uh, 
you don't have in-house people prepare, uh, preparing the LCA, you are asking a consultant to do it who has the correct software, who knows the latest, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then you need to provide good data or let them ask for data, but they are not knowledgeable about what you do. So it could be wrong. So we need to be very proficient uh, data collectors. We need to understand the full scope of the LCA we are doing, what to, to add, and, and I'm still improving. I've worked with this since the middle of the 90s when you sort of put up one finger in the air and say, yeah, maybe I can use this data set. And now we have databases for that. So, you know, it's developed. So I would say... Uh, like in hours, you're... maybe we could get like roughly hours yeah. or something. Yeah, like I, I would say months. Uh, it depends. Yeah. So if... Depending on, it could take half a year to collect the data, depending on your systems, or it could take less. And if you, depending on how the consultant work, it can take up to a half a year before they can sort of prevent the, present the uh, report. And then you need to go to the third party verifier, which could take an additional lead time weeks, because the, the actual work time is not uh, that much, but the lead time. And what about um, but in in hours, I say say like if we say like in efficient hours, maybe four hundred hours, something like that. Mm, yeah, was, is that ball, ballpark figures? Four hundred hours. Mm. If you start from zero, then of course, if you have one uh, vehicle with a certain specification and you make a new one that is similar, then of course it could be uh, less. Like yeah. less than. But starting from zero, I would say 400 hours. Mm. But then you are talking about the cons consultant part, not the in-house. No, that's true. It's yeah, true. yeah. So let's say an additional at least 400 hours yeah, in-house. Yeah. Yeah. So it's quite, and then we come back to again the value. It's like what is actually how is this evaluated in the end? That's something that we need to to continue talking about. And maybe I should mention one thing as well. I'm I'm also working with uh, substances of concern, and today we don't have an um, impact category, not in the EPD, that takes into account the toxicity of the substances. This means that. Uh, EPD cannot be the single um, question. It, it should also be about uh, clean waste streams, perhaps. And they are those questions are in the tenders today. Thanks a lot, Alejandro. Thanks a lot, Maria. Um, I think it's it's very clear that uh, there is uh, still a, a long road to go, even if uh, no, you, you were already looking into these aspects and the methodology might already have been uh, started developed, uh, uh, developing in the 90s. So, but I, perhaps the most important is that we are now getting busy with, uh, with sustainability of our products, our services, and we are very much looking into how to make it more sustainable with a uh, with a less uh, strong impact on, on the environment, but also on our societies at the end. Uh, it reflects on the quality of life in our cities and not only on an, a strategy towards zero emissions, right? So perhaps, um, because it's already 12, but I would have a very last question, perhaps. Um, what would you recommend? What would be your uh, yeah your recommendation for uh, for a transport authority and operator who is starting right now to look uh, looking into these aspects? So where what could be the first step, first two second steps you would recommend to them? I think it's just to to uh, learn about the subject as such about sustainability. What is relevant to ask in a tender? to put it on the correct, like an okay level. And also question yourself sometimes if you ask a question, why do I ask this? What will it lead to? Because we tend to see sometimes that uh, the questions are on such a detailed level, just for some parts. And uh, sometimes we don't really understand where does this add value. And also have a dialogue uh, with, uh, like with the, uh, with the OEMs, have a dialogue and uh, then, uh, Again, that uh, when we have this 
hopefully then in UITP we come up with something good in the tender structure document that should be a guideline. And um, so I think to um, yeah to to keep on having the conversation going and uh, learn more about the subject. I think that's uh, so just do not just throw out questions that you don't really understand yourself or you don't understand why you ask them. Exactly. Thanks a lot. I think that's a perfect closing for, for today. So we need to keep up the dialogue, understanding uh, what are the needs of the operator, the authorities, but also what can be supplied in terms of data, how to read this data, what makes sense uh, to be included in a tender or not, rather than just shooting for a specific methodology, perhaps not understanding exactly the background of it. Uh, thanks a lot uh, to you both. Uh, I think it has been a very nice, uh, a very nice uh, webinar. I thank you also uh, all the all the participants, uh, also the ones placing questions. I think it's it's the nicest part of a, of a webinar is when we have this interaction with with the participants and we can address mm -hmm. questions and and yeah and just increase a bit more uh, the knowledge of the group. Uh, and with this, uh, I would uh, I would conclude just uh, asking everyone to yeah to give a big applause to to our speakers, to both Maria and uh, yeah that would be that would be it for today. Thanks a lot. Uh, you will be receiving uh, the invitation for for the next webinar very soon. But uh, yeah, for today, thank you very much, both of you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very Bye. much.